All right, there is so much going on. Uh, the last time I had Andrew Bustamante on, we were just talking about Russia and Ukraine, hoping that wouldn't spill over into other NATO nations. Now we have this explosion of emotion and war going on in the Middle East again with Israel. Uh, Andrew, thank you so much for coming on today to help give a new perspective perspective on what's going on in Israel and uh, in Palestine. Yeah, thanks very much, Stephen, for having me. And I mean, dude, just like I told you in the green room before we got started, I'm fired up. There's a lot going on. The world is changing. And, you know, coming off of last night's presidential address, when President Biden said that we are at an inflection point in history, I couldn't agree with that statement more, even though for the most of what he said, I didn't really agree with. But that point was absolutely on target. Okay, great. Yeah, we'll get we'll get into that. Um, just before hitting record on this, uh, the remaining head of Hamas has called on all Arab nations to begin mobilizing their attack on Israel. How dangerous could this get? And are most nations civilized enough now to, to stay put? Or do you think we are going to see those attacks on Israel? Yeah, no, I don't, I don't think you're going to see the world attack Israel. And here's why. There's something that's, in, that's important to understand that most people are not talking about. Hamas as an organization did not exist until Israel started to force the Palestinians into an oppressive West Bank, East and Gaza Strip existence. There was no Hamas before 1987, I want to say it was, right? So Hamas as a group was born out of Israeli opposition, which is why Hamas's entire objective is to destroy Israel. Right. They were born out of Israeli opposite or oppression. And now their goal is to fight the oppressors that essentially were the birthplace of their organization. And the other thing that's important to understand, Hamas only exists in Palestine and Palestine only exists inside of what we all call Israel. There is no pal it's like Palestine is a state that they want to create inside the landmass that we all call Israel. Palestine is not like some some arbitrary term like Hamas is not some arbitrary term. Hamas is actually not even internationally recognized as a terrorist group. They're a legitimate political uh, party inside uh, inside Gaza. They rule Gaza. They don't rule Gaza like authoritarian. They were voted legislatively into power in Gaza. In fact, most Palestinians, most Muslims inside Israel are pro Hamas. The fact that we call Hamas a terrorist organization is a uniquely American thing. Even the UN doesn't list Hamas as a terrorist organization. The UN lists them as a political force, a political organization. So to hear the president get up and talk about Hamas like they are a terrorist group is a uniquely American point of view. And he's and the people don't understand that Hamas was born out of Israel's aggression against Palestinians. So what we're doing is we're losing the objectivity of history when we simply look at the current events that are happening now. Okay. And you've lived outside the United States. You've done uh, military work, intel work, CIA spy operative stuff outside. So maybe you can give us a unique perspective that we're not going to get from the mainstream media within the United States. Um, let's talk about two things, and then I want to jump into that. Um, the, the president of the United States has committed $100 million to Palestine humanitarian aid. Uh, at the same time, he's calling on U.S. Congress to use $100, $100 billion of taxpayer money to fund Israel, to fund Ukraine, and to fund Taiwan. Uh, so it, there's a lot of money commitments going on. Do you think that humanitarian aid will get to those that are struggling and suffering within Palestine? And then what are your thoughts on the 100 billion for these this three front war that we're, we're potentially opening? There's two things going on right now, for sure. And I think you're, you're touching on them, right, Stephen? So first, the, the fact that the president is trying to say that Hamas cannot interfere with humanitarian aid is a ridiculous request because Hamas is the government in Gaza. It's impossible to give humanitarian aid to Gaza without Hamas being involved. It's impossible. So the fact that he's saying that at all, the fact that he's putting that condition on it at all, is simply the fact he is provoking 
an expected response because he already knows that Israel and the United States will be able to say in the future that Hamas interfered with humanitarian aid, which is going to further fuel this conflict against Hamas and the Palestinians. It's He's setting this up, or his advisors are setting this up, with a very predictable outcome, very similar to why Hamas or why Iran supported Hamas attacking Israel in the first place. We are watching in real time a game of provocation. Iran wanted to provoke Israel to create a humanitarian crisis, and they, they succeeded. They succeeded in doing that, which shut down Israeli-Saudi Arabian ties that were, that were being built, right? Israel was coming closer to the Sunni Muslim world. They were making huge advances in UAE and Saudi Arabia uh, with Bahrain, world like world changing peace in the Middle East kind of advances. Iran wanted to interrupt that. So they funded the attack that Hamas launched into Israel. And now the Muslim world is in chaos again. And that's exactly what Iran wanted. They provoked Israel. Now the United States and Israel want to provoke continued conflict. So that's where this humanitarian aid restriction is coming from. They already know it's not going to happen. So now when people continue to suffer, when Palestinians continue to suffer, the United States and Israel can continue to blame Hamas and continue to call them terrorists and continue to attack Palestinians. That's the first thing. The second thing is this is becoming a political issue for the United States. The Congress can't approve a bill without a Speaker of the House. Well, guess what? We don't have a fucking Speaker of the House. So now the president, who's a Democrat leading into an election year, gets to say, hey, I put a bill out there, but the Congress can't figure their shit out. So now it becomes a political issue inside the United States where the Americans are like, oh, well, we've got to get this money out there because, you know, we've got to fight terrorism. It's all a giant show. It's it's a, it's what we call in, in the intelligence world. We call this a lie of omission. Critical pieces of information are being left out of the public narrative. And without those pieces of information, people don't get a full picture. This is another form of misinformation, mistaken or incomplete information. And we're seeing it happen in real time. And for those of us who are more aware of the geopolitical uh, impact of it all, we can see what's actually happening. A game of provocation in the Middle East between the United States, Israel, and the Muslim world, and this internal political battle between left and right, because when the bill goes to Congress and Congress can't pass without a Speaker of the House, it makes Republicans look like they're stupid. And that's exactly what the Democrats want leading into an election year. Well, I mean, they've they've walked right into the trap, if that's what it is, because uh, every mainstream media is like, these guys can't get it together. Everyone should be a Democrat, vote Democrat, because yeah. look how disorganized they're ruining the country. They're ruining Israel. Like, there's just so much emotion around this. Now, last night, um, oh, sorry, were you going to say something? I was going to say something really, It's yeah. I find this fascinating, right? Because Netanyahu the prime minister that we're all bending over backwards to support, he is actually standing under indictment for criminal fraud and corruption. He was ousted from the prime minister's seat in 2019, and the case is still ongoing. He is essentially what the Democrats are accusing Donald Trump of being. He is the same thing in Israel. Okay. But here the Democrats want to trash Donald Trump and say that the American system is, is being attacked. But then they want to stand behind Netanyahu, who is doing the exact same thing in Israel. Again, a piece of information that nobody's talking about, but it's heavily documented. It's just that people are so focused instead on terrorism, because the word terrorism strikes fear in the heart of all of us. When in fact, what Hamas is doing is only defined as terrorist activity by the United States and the United States closest allies, not by the UN. Yeah. Wow. Well, uh I mean, whenever there is this high alert uh, panic, right? We saw this during COVID where all of a sudden China started putting out uh, propaganda that people were getting COVID and then they would <laughs> die on the streets, right? They would die at the grocery store. They'd fall onto the subway train tracks and, and people started panicking. And then they were like, we got to shut down the whole world for 15 days. And then they basically locked it. They they use that fear against the human brain to get to get the pieces in place that they really want to move. And you're saying something similar is happening with the chaos in Israel right now. Exactly right. What we're experiencing is something that professionals call 
uh, intelligence and military professionals call the fog of war. The fog of war means that there is there is reality out there, but there's so much dust and so much dirt as people are fighting that you can't actually see the battlefield for what it really is. That's where we are right now. We're buried in the fog of war. Americans are confused. They're lost. They're angry. They're scared. And they have every right to feel that way. That is what the fog of war does to the human brain, to use your term, right, Stephen? That's a natural byproduct of our survival instinct. We get scared and angry simultaneously, right? It's something that we do to fight bears and tigers. It makes sense. The thing that's so frustrating to me is that we have this well-funded, well-established federal government that's supposed to reduce the noise instead of increase the noise. And because we have so many nasty politics at play right now in the Democratic Party to secure their seat for the next election, that they're actually increasing the fog of war when they could be telling us the truth. One piece of really fascinating truth came out of the presidential address last night, Stephen, that I think is worth highlighting. The president, for the first time ever, admitted that when we fund Ukraine, what we're really doing is sending them our old weapons and using the new money to fund the development of new weapons for ourselves. So he's saying that whenever we approve money, we're sending our old stuff to Ukraine and using our own money internally to create new weapons. And that means new jobs. Why the fuck wasn't he saying that two years ago? Yeah. Because two years ago, he wanted the American people to believe that we were sending our best to Ukraine. What he wants the American people to believe now is that we're creating jobs, right? It's all sh a shaping of the narrative, and it's very, very frustrating. It's standard it's standard practice for the federal government. I was in the government. I know how we, we, do, we do this stuff, but it's not beneficial right now. It's, it's turning into chaos, and it's hurting Americans right now. Yeah, wow. Yeah, no, I, I'm talking to people. And they don't have the language to say, I can't see through the fog of war. All they're saying is like, I don't know who to believe. And this hospital was blown up, but now I've been lied to. And, and I, I, I can't, you know, and, and I try to be a source of truth for people. But even I am trying to see through the fog at times, which is why I bring on guests that uh, know how the government operates. They know the chaos strategies. Uh, and, and so I appreciate you, you coming on. Um, go, let's go back to Iran and trying to uh, really stir things up. Uh, yesterday, Hezbollah from uh, Lebanon started firing rockets into northern Israel. Um, do you think that they are trying to uh, confuse Israel or spread their military thin so that they can't make this attack on Gaza? Or could they have been trying to provoke uh, the two U.S. aircraft carriers sitting in the mid uh, the Mediterranean. So it's important to understand that Hezbollah has been firing rockets into northern uh, Israel for a long time. They've been they they were there the day after Hamas attacked, October eighth, and they've been there in the past too. Hezbollah, the legitimate government in Lebanon, another group that the UN does not put on their list of terrorist organizations, but who the United States does call a terrorist organization, right? Hezbollah is the government of Lebanon. So in uh, in Lebanon, they're launching rockets into northern Israel as a show of support for Hamas's uh, plight, right, for the Palestinian state to become independent and free. Another thing to keep in mind here is that Palestine, which isn't a state at all, it's just land masses in Israel that have been segregated off, right? Palestine has no standing army. Hamas is a government with no military. They have a military wing, but that military wing only has rockets. And those rockets are homegrown rockets. They're like rockets that are made in people's garages, right? Israel is an established country with a military force, right? They have a professional standing military equipped with modern day American weapons. This is not an equal fight. Israel is essentially, uh, they have more people, more money, more support, and more guns. So when you think of the conflict happening in the Middle East right now, you essentially have to think of like a, a school playground. You've got all the little weak kids and then the big bully, right? The little weak kids are actually the Muslims right now. The Palestinians, they're, they're poor, they're marginalized, they're oppressed, they're food. Like they are actually, according to human rights, 
Israel is ex has been committing human rights abuses against the Palestinians for decades, right? Apartheid is still alive and well, according to the Human Rights Council in Palestine, because of the way the Israelis treat the Palestinians, which is the reason why the Palestinians even had the idea of creating a group like Hamas to fight back. So Hezbollah is doing the same thing. Hezbollah is another weak Muslim group that is fighting against the big bully in the region. It doesn't have to do with provoking the United States. The, the, the secret here, again, that's so frustrating to me from the Biden administration, President Biden got in front of the American people last night and said, this is a national security priority, that we need to support Israel, we need to support Ukraine. That's a lie of omission. There is no threat to the United States coming from either of these wars. Russia doesn't want to invade the United States. He doesn't want to attack. Putin's had no plans to attack the United States or any NATO ally. He's going after Ukraine. Palestine has no fight with the world. They only have a fight with their opposed, their opposition or their, their oppressor, Israel. There is no threat to the United States coming from Hamas. Hamas only exists in Israel. There is no threat to the United States coming from Hezbollah. Hezbollah exists in Lebanon. There's no threat coming to the United States from Russia. So to call it a national security threat against the United States is not the complete truth. That's what's frustrating. Gotcha. Okay. Um, I, I've heard many people in the media, many people in the intelligence world, uh, government leaders like over in China, they're saying, listen, uh, the attack on Israel was horrible, um, but they now risk going too far in their revenge that they're going to end up looking like the bad guy, right? And just today, Israel put out that they are uh, planning a three-phase war. Uh, first, airstrikes and ground attack. That's what we're about to witness right now. Second, eradicating pockets of resistance. Last, to cease responsibility for life. Uh, that's the one that I don't fully understand because it almost makes it sound like we're going to completely wipe Gaza off the face of the map. But then other people are saying, no, 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 this just means, hey, we're done taking care of you. No more water from us, no more food, no more electricity, no more internet. What What are your thoughts on this this three-phase war? Because it, to me, it, 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 it looks like it's going to get really ugly. And then Israel is going to look like the big bag bully versus the person that just wanted to get back for the 1,200 murders. Yeah, it's, it's too late for that, Stephen. Honestly, the world outside of the United States, because keep in mind, Americans are, we're trapped in a, a bit of an echo chamber where we really only listen to American news and we really only listen to our American leadership. We don't really understand how the rest of the world thinks. Outside of the United States, the world supports Palestine. The world is not supporting Israel right now. And if you do just, just based on body counts, because Israel has such an advanced military, they've already injured three times as many Palestinian civilians as Israeli civilians were injured in the one day of the attack, right? There have been no Hamas incursions into Israel since October 7th. All attacks, all killing has happened inside Gaza from the Israeli military attacking civilian targets because there's no standing military. So there are no military targets. Because Israel calls Hamas terrorists, it means that any place that a Hamas supporter lives, they're essentially a terrorist outpost. Any political leader, anybody who has any, any sheriff, any congressperson, any senator inside, inside Gaza is essentially labeled a terrorist. And that gives Israel carte blanche to do whatever they want. And the United States supports them because the United States also calls Hamas terrorists, right? What we're really seeing happen here, Stephen, is Iran is winning. And Iran is not the only person at play here. And I'm going to unpack that in a second. Okay. Iran is winning because they wanted to provoke an attack from Israel. Not only did they provoke Israel to overreact, I believe they have launched Israel into Israel's version of the Vietnam War. Israel has now made commitments that it, if it sees through these commitments, if it actually does what it says it will do, it will lose support of the entire world. They are intentionally creating a humanitarian crisis. They are starving and, and hiding and keeping medicine and water away from innocent people, children, women, elderly, you know, every, like they're, they are intentionally killing civilians 
under the rubric, under the, the promise that they're also killing terrorists. This is the same strategy that Russia is using in Ukraine, right? Ukraine, at least in Ukraine, there was a formal decree that all fighting age males were conscripted into military service. So now when Russia bombs an electric an electric electricity plant in Ukraine, a civilian target in Ukraine, it can at least claim that it's neutralizing electricity because the country's full of military aged men. When Israel bombs Gaza, Gaza made no no conscription. There's no decree by the by the by government in Gaza that says that all people are military aged fighters, right? It just said that, hey, Hamas is our military wing and they're doing what they do with rockets and they don't have ground forces. So I believe Israel has launched into their version of the Vietnam War. And that's what we're going to see play out over the coming weeks and months, unless Netanyahu pulls his head out of his ass and realizes that he's being played. He's being played by Iran. And Iran is a, a member of a three-member party that wants to destroy Western power in the world. Iran, Russia, and China. Their number one goal is to make the United States and its Western allies look like they are corrupt and one-sided and unfair and, and failed because they want the world to move alliances from the West to essentially this new center of power in the East. Russia and Ukraine was the start of that move to make America look bad. Iran just played a fantastic card to make America and Israel look bad. But there's still one player on the board who hasn't made a move yet. What, what's the next move? What do you think? <laughs> That's exactly. I've said for a long time that I believe China will move against Taiwan okay. during our election cycle in 2025, in 2024. Okay. That is exactly what I believe the next step is. There is a doctrine in military science that says that no winning military can fight a war on two fronts. President Biden got up last night and told the American people that we need to support wars on two fronts. If the military doctrine, if the best knowledge out there says that you can't win a two front war, what do you think it means about a three front war? And that's exactly what China's looking at. China's always playing uh, playing the, the math, the, the probabilities, how fast can they move on Taiwan and what support can the U.S. offer? If yeah. the U.S. is busy supporting us, Israel through their Vietnam and supporting Ukraine, and you know Russia has been advancing since October 9th, within two days of the attack from Hamas against Israel, Russia launched an offensive campaign and they've been taking territory back in Ukraine. That's not making headlines because everybody's yeah. too busy talking about Israel. So so Iran is winning, Russia is winning, and the United States has no Speaker of the House to approve funding. So we look like assholes. It's, yeah. This is exactly what China wants as they calculate when they're going to move on Taiwan. Yeah, well, and, uh, you know, the, the biggest moneymaker for Iran is coming from China with all that money flowing in from oil. Um, you know, what you're saying is is really interesting because uh, you know you're saying that Iran is walking Israel into this like global media trap where if they go in, every media, mainstream media to uh, foreign global media, they're all saying Palestine is full of children. Yep. Right. And as I've studied 9/11, most of the military in, and intel people are saying. When Bill Clinton and the United Kingdom killed half a million children in the Middle East, that's what got bin Laden and others to say, we have to strike back at the United States. What do you think is going to happen if all of these children in Palestine get innocently wiped out in a revenge attack? Uh, wow. Ugh. It's ugly. Yeah, it's ugly, it makes dude. me it's sick gonna, to it, think about. It creates ulcers for us, right? But that's unfortunately, that's the game that's being played right now. And Israel isn't Israel is blind to it because they think that they're in a war against a terrorist group. That's what they're telling themselves. And that's what they're telling their own people. It's also important to understand that on October 6th, support for Netanyahu inside Israel was at an all time low. They had just voted him into prime ministership the previous year. He's under investigation for corruption and uh, and um, 
I just lost it. Uh, he's he's under criminal fraud for corruption and fraud. He's been in power for a combined total of 16 years, and he was trying to change the judicial system from within so that he could no longer be under indictment. So Israelis have for a long time now mistrusted and disliked Netanyahu. So when Hamas attacked, that was like that was a, a release valve for him. He now had something that he could focus the Israeli people on other than his own fraudulent and corrupt rule in power. You know who Netanyahu's close friends with? Vladimir Putin. The yeah. two men are friends and allies. Yeah. So that means Putin knows exactly how Netanyahu will respond to something. And the two of them have a straight line of communication. So it's it makes perfect sense that Iran would communicate with Russia about how they distract the West. Putin would be able to predict Netanyahu's response almost exactly, not to mention the fact that he can call Netanyahu on a little presidential phone and encourage him to continue attacking Palestine. Right. There, the Israel is being played and they are going to they have already lost one foot to stand on. The world supported them on October 8th. Nobody supports them outside of the United States really right now, which is why the president of the fucking United States had to get on TV and essentially beg the American people to support Israel, because we're all a little confused. Like, how is this fair? How is this legal? Which it's not. According to international courts, Israel is committing war crimes, just like Russia is committing war crimes in Ukraine. But we're not being told that message from our leadership. We're being forced to find it on our own through our own research. And our, our government instead is playing this as a political chip in the ongoing Republican versus Democrat bipolarization. Well, I, I wish we were watching this in like a Netflix movie and not in real time. Uh, I agree. This, this stuff's been hard to cover. It's very emotional. Uh, there, there is a fog of war. Um, people are being played. Old allies are betraying each other. New allies uh, are, are forming. Um, but, you know, Iran <laughs> is, have, I hate to say it, they have done a great job of moving the chess pieces and creating this tinderbox uh, stoked by emotion um, and, you know, hopefully people can see through this, but right now it doesn't look like they are. Right. And well, I mean, the future will tell the biggest story, right? If Israel continues to actually execute this three-part plan, I mean, there's, there's no appetite among the American public for the killing of innocent women, children, and elderly. That's, that is a massacre and a humanitarian crisis for sure. Yeah. Uh, and across the Muslim world, there is no appetite for the continued oppression of the Palestinian people. So Israel is is not only cutting itself off at the knees within its own Middle Eastern community, but it's also cutting itself off at the knees with support from the United States. So this is a game that that they are not going to win. And it's a game that only benefits the enemies of the United States. I understand why the president is asking for American support, because he understands that if he goes into an election year with two wars raging where the American allies are losing, then America is going to think that we look weak. But he's also playing a financial game where he understands that we are in a financial crisis. And the only way that we prevent our financial crisis is by finding a way to keep money into our own system, which is why he wants us to be sending humanitarian aid and weapons abroad, because essentially then the government can pay into the American economy and keep us afloat. But it's a it's a it's a bad game. It's a rough place to be. Uh, and I respect where the president is, but I don't respect how he's handling the situation. Gotcha. Thank you so much for your input. If people want to follow you is the Everyday Spy uh, podcast and YouTube channel the best way to do that? Yeah, absolutely. Follow, go to everydayspy.com if you want to learn what I'm teaching. And if you uh, if you want to just follow what we're doing on YouTube at Everyday Spy and across all social media, you'll find us at Everyday Spy as well. Great. Andrew Bustamante, thank you for coming on. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Appreciate it, Stephen. Take care, sir.